that we can pray in that name. Okay, if we could turn to the book of Matthew. And tonight, for those of you who got the handout, the initial mail out that Richard sent only had half of the notes. But uh, we're going to be looking at uh, observations on hermeneutics and exegesis. We're going to do it by hands-on approach, just comparing verses from the Old and New Testaments. And let's see where this leads us and just some, some real basic, useful observations. So Matthew chapter 2, Brother David, could you please read for us verses 14 and 15? I will. Um, 14 says, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Her Her uh, Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying <clears throat> out of it, I call my son okay so for us in the year 2022 this is very clear it's very easy for us to get our minds around this <clears throat> when joseph brought jesus out of egypt this fulfilled the word of the lord spoken through hosea the prophet out of egypt i call my son but if we could go back to the book of hosea just right after daniel chapter 11 and what we want to ask is the people who were living in the days of hosea about more than 700 years before the birth of jesus how would they have understood this or how might they have understood it? And okay. So chapter 11, verse one, anybody who has that, if you could read that, please. Hosea 11, one. I've got it. Mm -hmm. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Okay, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, we don't want to go there, <clears throat> but um, uh, God told Moses to tell Pharaoh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So here the, the book of uh, the prophet Hosea, the oracle is, so imagine we're in the year 700 something BC, and we hear or we read this oracle. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt, I called my son. How would we almost certainly understand this? Greetings, Stefano. How would we understand this? Would we understand this as uh, speaking forward to a time when the Son of God, born of a virgin, is being brought out of Egypt back to the land of Israel? Of course not. We don't. We would not have had the point of view that we now have we when we were if we were living in the time of hosea we would have understood this only as a historical reference to when god brought the nation of israel out of egypt and the oracle does refer to that but there's two levels the deeper level does not unpackage in the history of god's revelation to humankind until many centuries after this oracle was first given. Would everybody agree with the points so far made? Okay, these are common sense observations. But why is this important? Because when we talk about exegesis, we're talking about bringing out the meaning of the verse. And what is implied is that we're doing some work to bring out the meaning we're doing we're digging we're doing some research to bring out that word ek like exodus exegesis we're bringing out the meaning and hermeneutics is the approach we take in doing our exegesis so a common hermeneutical approach leans heavily upon doing word studies like the etymology of a word, how a word is used. So it's called grammatical and historical background study. So it's called grammatical historical method. And it's very useful. It's very valuable. It, it, it's, it's very helpful to us. But at the same time, 
there are severe limitations on how useful it can be because if we insist that in all Bible prophecy, we have to, we have to go back and reconstruct the historical situation, the time in which the prophecy was given, and, and we have to grasp how it was understood by the people of that time and what the intended meaning of the biblical writer was. So what would be the limitation of that approach in this particular instance? The limitation would be that the people in the time of Hosea could not possibly have understood the deeper level of meaning, which we're able to easily grasp, not because we're smarter than them, but because we live in a time in history where we have the standpoint of God's unpackaging of the meaning. So right away, we're noticing a limitation to the usefulness of grammatical, historical interpretation. So now what I would like to do is go, to, go back to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. And if anybody would read for us verses 21 through 23. Greetings, Brother Lalo. How you doing? <laughs> hey, man. Great to see they, you. Glad you're joining they, us there on your bicycle. Yeah, they changed my group time, so I'm going to be riding from now on while listening to you. That's I love it, there. though. Amen, brother. Okay. Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. If anybody would read that. This is she will angel. bear a son, mm -hmm. okay. and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Okay, so again, for us, in the year 2022, we read this passage, and it's very clear to us. We don't understand all the mysteries of how God could pull this off, but it's very clear to us that a woman who was a virgin, while still a virgin, conceived and bore a son. Well, let's go back to, to Isaiah chapter 7, the verse which Matthew quotes and says that the conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary, while still a virgin, fulfilled the word of the Lord, which is in Isaiah chapter 7. So I'm going to go ahead and read this here. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. But let me just give a little bit of, of um, historical background, but only from history in the Bible itself, not going outside the Bible. There was a king named Ahab, or Ahaz, excuse me, and he was the king of Judah. Okay, remember the kingdom split after Solomon's death, the northern breakaway tribes called the kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. So Ahaz is king of Judah, and the king of Israel and the king of Syria are coming against the king of Judah. And God sends a prophecy to the king of Judah, to Ahaz, assuring him, he says, I'm, I'm going to give you a sign to show you that I'm with you. Don't worry about these two kings. He says in verse 14, Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Verse 15 and 16. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. So in the immediate context, the king is being told that the child who is going to be born uh, before he knows how to choose good from evil that both of these kings the king of israel and the king of syria are going to be dealt with and in chapter 8 of isaiah verse 3 isaiah says then i went to the prophetess and she conceived and bore a son okay so in the context of this passage we have the king being told that a virgin will conceive and bear a son. So let's let's give some thought to this. 
although the word for virgin can also be translated young maiden or woman of marriageable age, we know without needing to go outside the Bible, from the historical context in the Bible itself, that in that time and place, a young woman of marriageable age would be assumed to be a virgin. If it was found out that she's not a virgin, what would that mean for her family and for her? Big trouble, right? So when the Greek scholars around starting in the third century BC began translating the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, they used the word that is unambiguously for virgin, Parthenos, virgin. So we got no problem here with, with understanding that this clearly means the word virgin. The prophecy is a virgin shall conceive. So let's suppose, let's imagine that we are there in the time of Hosea, more than 700 years before the birth of Jesus. How are we going to understand this? Are we going to understand this prophecy as saying, there is a woman who is a virgin and she's going to know a man and conceive and bring forth a son? Or are we going to understand this as saying, there is a woman who is a virgin and while still a virgin, she's going to conceive and bear a son? Which of those two are we going to understand this as saying, as meaning? The first. The first, obviously. The prophecy just says, the virgin shall conceive. So we're going to assume, okay, there's a woman who's a virgin. She's going to know a man and bring forth a son. And in chapter 8, um, Brother Jackson, can we get you a mute, please? Brother Anthony? Thank you, brother. Okay. Um, Brother, Brother Jackson? Brother yeah. Anthony? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, okay. So the chapter 8, verse 3 tells us that Isaiah went into the prophetess and she conceived and bore a son. So it's if we're living in the years 700 something BC and we're sticking with grammatical historical method and we're insisting that we have to understand it the way it was understood when it was first spoken. We're not going to think that a woman who's a virgin, while still being a virgin, is going to conceive and bring forth a son. We're going to assume that the woman who is a virgin is going to know a man and bring forth a son. But because we live on the other side of history and we have the word of God in the book of Matthew and we know the true his history of Mary, who while still a virgin conceived and brought forth a son, we're able to understand this in a way that the people of Isaiah's time could not possibly have understood it. Nobody on the earth um, imagined that a woman who still being a virgin would conceive and bring forth a son. Okay, so, so what we're seeing here is, again, the limitations of grammatical historical method and the need to see the Bible as a unity, as one story. So when we see something like a, a marketing, advertising, Old Testament theology and New Testament theology, already our guards should be up. Why is anyone wanting to divide the Bible in that way? It's not possible to understand the Old Testament without the New Testament. The Bible is one story. It all works together. And so if we could go now to let's see if somebody could read for us who has the handout, please read number two. Observations on the grammatical historical method, its value and limitations, abuse and exegesis. This method attempts to reconstruct ancient environments, culture, language, thought forms, historical situation to show the intended meaning of the biblical writer and how people of that time would likely have understood the same. Okay, what I want to pause and do here is look at some problems with this. The attempt to reconstruct the ancient environment and attempt so that we can understand how the people of that time would have understood the oracle. Uh, there is a verse in Matthew chapter 24 that says, two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other will be left. 
if we were to go through different churches from different denominations and ask a hundred Christians, what is your understanding of this verse? A majority of them, if they're from mainstream evangelical churches, would say, well, it means that when Jesus comes for the church, the one who's saved is going to be taken and the unsaved will be left behind. But those who have carefully read the passage itself and seen how Jesus is building an analogy as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the son of man. They were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the flood came and took them all away. Who is the pronoun them referring to? Obviously the unsaved. So, so it shall be in when the son of man returns. Two will be in the field. One will be taken according to a straightforward reading of the analogy. Which one is taken? Obviously the unsaved is taken and the one who is saved remains is left behind to inherit the earth just as those in the ark re remained and inherited the earth made new symbolically washed with water so the point here is not whether or not we believe in a rapture before the tribulation the point is that we can take this verse and ask how we christians in the year 2022 understand that verse and we're going to get different answers so let's transfer this back to the question how would people thousands of years ago on the other side of the world have understood this particular oracle in most cases we don't have a clue we don't even know how people of our own time are going to understand a verse okay so and now let's do an application outside of scripture and let's take a current event there's a claim that is believed by many americans that the 2020 presidential elections were stolen a lot of people believe this a former president insists on this and yet but a lot of americans are baffled as to why anyone would take this seriously so i have a person who's close in my life actually one of my sisters who said to me and she used an example from one of the states. I don't remember what it was, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Arizona, somewhere. She said, it's obvious that there was uh, manipulation with the election. It's obvious. But yet there are many other millions of Americans who look at the millions who insist the election was stolen and say, how can you take that seriously? So again, the point is not whether or not we believe the election was stolen. The point is that in our own time, people are looking at the same data and coming away with radically different interpretations. So this comes back to our hermeneutical issue. When a teacher tells us you've got to reconstruct the historical situation so that you can know the intended meaning of the biblical writer and how the audience of that time would have understood it. Um, what I'm trying to point out is that we're going too far when we insist on that. A teacher who insists that for us to properly understand an Old Testament verse of scripture, we need to do a historical reconstruction and understand how the people of that time would have understood it. That is a total misfire. Misfire. Okay. Any comments? Hey, any comments? And uh, we and, need uh, the brother with the iPhone to brother with the iPhone to please mute. Thank you. Okay, any comments on what we've looked at so far with historic, what is, what do we mean by grammatical historical method? You mean to go back <clears throat> to get a clearer understanding of what the verse is saying today, you go back and look at the grammar and the history of that time, hoping that it'll shed light on what it means, um, what a clearer meaning might mean today. Okay. Can that be valuable to us, Richard? Yes. Yes. Can it also be abused? Yes. Okay. So that's all what we're saying here. It's like eating. We have to eat to stay alive, but how much do we eat? So we want to recognize the limits of what we can know. Uh, as I was sharing with Richard before the study started, 
if we were doing a study 25 years ago and I'm leading the study, you would see me load in a lot more background information, a lot more stuff from say Anchor Bible Dictionary, sources outside the Bible, background studies. What happened with me is it took a lot of years, but I began to notice that what is considered background information today with a new archeological discovery that can be outdated overnight. And now we've got new background information, whereas the Bible has stayed the same. So I began to just take stock of the fact that background information is useful when we have to go outside the Bible and search historical sources. And we can pin down generalities such as, we know that Alexander led his armies into Persia and conquered the Persian kingdom. We know that we, we don't have we don't have really any doubts about that, um, and we have pretty good reasons for believing that Alexander died in Babylon at about the age 30, 33. But the more we push out into detail, the more we move out into unstable ground. Okay, uh, when we turn from the last page of the Old Testament to the first page of the New Testament, right away we start seeing things that were found nowhere in the Old Testament. There's these Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, there's baptisms, there's all this stuff going on that developed during the period between Malachi and the beginning of the New Testament writings. When we take the time to research literature from that intertestamental period, we can come up with a lot of stuff and we can get some general ideas of, of what took place. We know that the Pharisees first show up in the historical record in the early days of the Maccabean Revolution, say 160s BC, 150s, somewhere around there. Uh, we, we, we can come up with a lot of information like that, but the more we push for detail, the more we're getting into unstable ground because new discoveries can outdate what is currently believed today about background studies. So we want to just realize that we can't draw a hard and fast line between how much background information we should rely upon. We want to utilize it for its value, but we want to, to recognize the difference between using background information to enrich our understanding of a verse and using background information to change the meaning of a verse. And there are commentators, any, any commentator who is locked into a system of theology is going to abuse historical grammatical method. He's going to, and here would be an example. If we could go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is from a show that I saw on a major Christian television network where there were two men who announced that they were going to show a verse that proves the church will be raptured before the tribulation the reason they came out with this is because they said look we're always being asked why does this teaching of a pre-tribulational rapture depend entirely on interpretations why can't you show us a verse where it actually says that? And the two guys said, we're going to show you a verse. So they took us to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. And here's what it reads. Let no one deceive you by any means. So that's a big deal, right? The apostle by the Holy Spirit saying, by no means, don't let anybody deceive you on this point. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. What is that day referring to? In the immediate context, verse 1, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. In the immediate context, obviously, that day is a reference to Christ coming for the church. That day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So this falling away, the word apostasia, falling away. We're all familiar with the word apostasy. But if you break that down etymologically, it's from two words, a preposition apa, 
and stasis, which is from and stand, stand from. So they said, see, the word means stand from. How can the church stand from unless it's raptured off the earth? So the church is standing from the world because it was raptured. So they believe that they had found proof of a rapture of the church before the tribulation. So that would be an example of using a word etymology in a way that would force the passage to line up with the requirements of a theological system. So what do we learn from that? Do we learn that we should never do a word etymology study? Or do we learn that a word study, a word etymology study can be useful in helping enrich our knowledge of the meaning of a verse, but a word study can also be abused to change even the clearest worded verses. That no one deceive you by any means, that day, the day of Christ coming for the church, will not take place until there's first a falling away. It's going to be a widespread apostasy. Churches themselves, people go to hear truth. They're not going to hear truth there anymore. There will be a falling away, and the man of sin is, will be revealed. So there's an example of an abuse of a word study. So if we could go back now to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, and we want to read <clears throat> verses 3 and 4. And let me go ahead and read this, okay? This is Isaiah prophesying seven centuries before Jesus. And he says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. So if we have a teacher who says in all Old Testament Bible prophecy, the prophecy has to be understood literally, not figuratively. Literal, in, the rule of literal interpretation of Old Testament Bible prophecy. So if we're in the in 700 years BC, and we hear or read these verses, this prophecy, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. You think, huh, are we going to build a road in the middle of the desert for our God? Now, verse four, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. So is God going to flatten the land? Is that how we would have understood it? Well, if we insist on a literal method of interpretation in all Old Testament prophecy, then we have to understand this as a prophecy that God's going to flatten the earth. So I think that all of us would find that ridiculous. So what we've, what we, here's the question we would ask that. We, if somebody, if a teacher says, we got to go with the plain meaning of the verse, well, we ask, Plain to whom? To whom is it plain? Is it plain when Jesus said one will be taken, the other will be left? Is it, is, is it plain to everybody that the one who's taken is the unsaved? Or is it plain to everybody that the one who's taken is saved? It all depends on who the person is. It's not, you say plain, the plain meaning, what is plain to who? Is it plain that the election was stolen? Or plain that the election was not perfect, but it was good enough? So what we need to watch for here is commentators, teachers who want to take a one-dimensional approach to interpreting Bible prophecy and lock us into, it's got to be plain or it's got to be literal. It's got to be grammatical, historical. It, it, it's really is not the way language works. Let's use an example with the word run. I put it, I put it here in the handout on page two, uh, number three, paragraph C. And I, I use the word run in five different ways. It says, he is going to run some laps. When we hear the word run, what do we usually think? Our first thought meaning is to physically run. He's going to run some laps. Or he is going to run to the store. Let's say I, I say to my, my wife, honey, I'm going to run to the store. 
Is it actually to have to literally mean that I'm going to run? Of course not. Uh, he is going to run up the score. Say we have one co football coach and he really dislikes the coach in the other team. It's three minutes into the fourth quarter. They're already 25 points ahead. And he tells his assistant coach, we're going to run up the score on these guys. Obviously, that's a figurative use of the word run, but the sentence overall has a literal meaning. Then we've got he is going to run a game or he is going to run for office. So there's five different uses of the word run and four of them, the word run was used figuratively, but the sentence itself had a literal meaning. So if we can have sentences in which a word is used figuratively, but the overall meaning of the sentence is literal, then what do we even really mean when we say literal interpretation of the Bible? So we have to watch these, these um, and, 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 and re always remember that Word meaning is determined by context, not by word etymology. Word etymology can be helpful. Word meaning is determined by context, not by historical reconstruction of how people thought thousands of years ago on the other side of the world. That could be helpful. We saw that in Isaiah chapter 7, when it said a virgin shall conceive. People of Isaiah's time would have assumed that a young woman of marriageable age was a virgin. We don't assume that in our time. That time is long past in our culture. So it can be useful. But if a teacher tries to impose it as a, a grid through which we have to pull every verse of Bible prophecy, then we need to be aware that he has been trained to do this in order to force the Bible into the shape of the theological system that he's committed to marketing. So the main point here. Be careful with overly academic, overly scientific, or one-dimensional methods in our exegetical labors. Different hermeneutical approaches can powerfully shape our exegetical results. Through prayer and conscious reliance on Christ through the Spirit, and I put three things here. We need patience. We have to patiently search the scriptures. We need diligence, and we need one another, I put. So... Why do we need one another? When it comes to something as important as doing exegetical work to bring out the meaning of an Old Testament prophecy, why do we need one another? Why can't I just do my own exegetical research, uh, make my conclusions, and just dogmatically declare that to everybody? Because you're not perfect. Right, right. <laughs> you know, everybody slips up. And we need one another in that fashion to see the point of view from somebody else. And then we might say, oh, yeah, right. You're Good. So, unfortunately, when a young Christian goes to a seminary, and that seminary is committed to promoting a certain form of theology, for example, we'll have a classroom, say there's 40 students. We have a young, a young man sitting there. I'm really hungry. I want to learn. I want to, be, I want to be prepared for ministry. And there up front is the teacher, the scholar, the professor who's suited and has all kinds of academic credentials. And he tells us that there is something called the law of first use, the law of first mention. And when we're studying Bible prophecy, We've got to remember the law of first use. Well, because of the nature of how things work, it's not likely that very many of those 40 students, if even one, is going to think, wait a minute, who made that law? And I'm going to go into the Bible and find out if that law is really there. Well, for anybody who would do that, you're going to see right from the very beginning of the Bible that you could find hundreds of examples to contradict that law. It's not a law at all. But how many of those seminary students are going to call the professor aside and, and ask him who made this law? And how come I see all these verses in the Bible that contradict it? Uh, unfortunately, the professor, if he's been with that program for a while, will have already been trained in the apologetics for that particular theology. And he will have a complicated answer 
for why the Bible only seems to contradict the law of first use, which itself was created to reinforce places in the system that are not stable. So we, we want to, um, when, we're, when we're listening to somebody teach, we want to be aware of these sleights of hand, just slipping in something, like I said, the law of first use, or, well, you have to understand that in those times, the people would have understood this verse in such and such a way. Well, how do we know that? Or here's the worst of all, the most serious of all. If, we, if the teacher says, you have to understand what the prophet Jeremiah was intending to mean, or what the prophet Daniel was intending to mean when he wrote that. Because 1 Peter chapter 1 tells us that when the Old Testament prophets were writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they themselves did not understand what they were writing. And when they inquired, it was shown to them that what they were writing about would only be revealed at a later time. So that's something real important to keep in mind. We're reading a commentary, and it's talking about the intended meaning of the author, the biblical author. That's a serious misfire. So just in summary, and then we'll open it up for discussion. We've made some observations on what exegesis is, putting in the work to bring out the meaning of a verse, and how hermeneutics is the approach we take in doing our exegetical work. And we've looked at how different hermeneutical approaches can powerfully shape what the results of our exegetical work are gonna be. So we want to be careful with this thing called hermeneutics. We don't want to allow our minds to be brainwashed by any particular package of hermeneutical instruments that have been created to force the Bible into the shape of a particular theological system. We want to, um, again, rely on common sense readings. We want to rely upon one another to run our ideas by one another. And we want to always hold the teachers to honesty and not allow a teacher at any time to take us to a verse and see, say, see, now this verse means, we think, wait a minute, we, we don't need a teacher to tell us what a verse means. We need a teacher who will point out to us what the verse itself says and how the verse connects with other verses, which provide themselves a commentary on this verse. Okay. So having made those points, then I want to uh, stop now and open it up for any comments or questions or discussion on what we've looked at so far. How does this help us to see that we've got to look at the Bible as one story and you can't divide it up into Old Testament studies, New Testament studies? Yeah, I think I hear that sometimes in a lot of churches. You might hear like, well, that was the Old Testament. And we're in the New Testament now, right? And um, there's something missing there. And there's something going on in that church for that to be missing, for people to just be saying that so openly. And and um, or they'll... Um, emphasize the love of God in the new Testament and say like, God isn't, you know, a just God anymore. Like all those, you know, deaths of animals and children when his judgment came down before, you know, he's not like that anymore. And so I think that's where it would be important to point out, you know, we have one um, Bible, one story, a uh, consistent message. And if we find that there's something that's amiss the problem is not with god or his word the problem is with us <clears throat> i can think of instances where it's fine if you read the king james bible and the song of solomon the one that comes to my mind um it, it speaks of a turtle dove uh, or a, a, um yeah i hear it no just uses turtle like i hear the turtle sing and i think like wow the man, you know did turtles sing back then you know, no. And, you know, that was in the 1600s, the word that they used for the turtle dove, what, which we just call the dove or the turtle dove today. But um, so those are easy instances where to do a little 
you know, historical grammatical might work, but <laughs> you know, the, uh, and the last thing I would say is I've, I've also heard it, Pat, when Jesus caught, like, I don't know if it was 157 fish and, um, in the New Testament with guys like Harold Camping, it'd be like, you take the one, you divide it by five, and then, you know, you get the seven and, you know, you do this and that, and you come up with 1997, and that's the end of the world. And, 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 and people are, some Christians are like in awe by that, like, oh my God, that's amazing. You know, the Bible code, we need to buy that Bible code book. And it's always like some, Spurgeon once said, if it's new, it's probably not true. And if it's true, it's probably not new. That's what comes to mind for me. Okay, so we we want to then, like you said, that you know we have one Bible. Um, humans didn't create the Bible, but humans did create theology. Or we could say like humans didn't create nature, but humans created science. So we want to um, like in these studies. I'm always urging us to um, we can use theology, but Bible study. Think of the difference if we think, okay, well, what is theology? Theology really, in its widest sense, is, okay, we read a verse of the Bible, and then we start talking about it. Well, we're doing theology. That's in the widest sense. But uh, when we go far enough, we have like a, like, think of the difference between R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur. R.C. Sproul was a theologian. John MacArthur is well-versed in theology, but except for his eschatology his last time studies all of his teachings are are bible studies when he gets into eschatology the theology takes over but that's a good example of a difference between bible study and theological studies where uh we 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 have a bible and if it were possible for anyone to create a system then all christians would agree that that's that's the system we would not have different ones so since we only we have one Bible, we need to hold so closely to it and always be aware that we're being attacked on so many different levels. Try any way to, for some voice to try to get between us and the Bible. Even voices that say, read your Bible. The Bible is the absolute authority, but then they want to get between us and the Bible and tell us what it means. We can't allow that. We can't allow any teacher to do that. So we got to keep our, our, our eyes wide open. Whenever we're talking about hermeneutics, uh, approaches to how we do our ex exegetical work. Okay. It's true, right? Oh, any well, other comments? You know, showers just took them today. Okay. Okay. Patrick, I was thinking you said the Old Testament and the New. Some people say, well, they're different. If that was so, uh, the Holy Spirit, God Almighty, would not put in all the verses in the New Testament of the Old Testament, you know? Yeah. Right. I mean, how many scriptures are there uh, that are duplicated in the New Testament from the old, you know? Right. And we looked at a couple tonight, you know, uh, Jesus coming out of Egypt, fulfilling the word to Hosea. There's no way we could have known that just from reading Hosea. So to say we're going to do Old Testament theological studies, that's to cut off the source from which we get the light to even see what the meaning of the Old Testament is. So we got to look at the whole Bible as one book, comparing verses with verses, and put in the work to do our exegesis with a hermeneutics or an approach to the Bible that is um, is common sense. Okay, yeah. Patrick, I'd like to say something. Sure, David. Uh, yeah, I I agree with everything that's said tonight, and um, uh, that I look at the. Um, uh, the one Bible is the Old Testament uh, foretells about Christ and the New Testament uh, uh, fulfills Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, relying on each other is, is, is great. You know, uh, iron sharpens iron and we should uh, be able to come uh, uh, with, with each other, uh, come together and, and talk about uh, the scripture and what it means is i when i when i pray i ask god for his holy wisdom and knowledge so i can understand the scripture and um 
that's something that I like to do daily when before I read the scripture, so so I can have that uh, that blessing of of understanding. Amen. Okay, and and uh, thank you for sharing that. And what I want to conclude with is this point. By our going back and asking, how would we have understood these verses in Isaiah or Hosea if we were living in those times? This helps us to appreciate what we have. By living when we do, after Jesus has come, the Holy Spirit's been given, having this complete Bible, that is an amazing privilege. Jesus said, many, many prophets and righteous men have desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So let's rejoice in this, be thankful, take the Bible, not as a book with just ink on pages, but as a book that comes alive, alive for us in our minds, in our lives, the Bible is alive in our conversations. So, okay, so with that, unless there's any other comments, we'll go ahead and close out.